Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial and Midnight. My name is Heath, and this is a very special episode because we are joined by a giant, uh, Ron Dante, producer, uh, singer. You know him from the, he's the voice of the Archies. Uh, background vocals on Mandy. You produce Copacabana with Barry Manilow. Uh, music legend. So thank you, Mr. Dante, for being here to talk to us. It's my pleasure to be here, Heath. Thanks for inviting me. This it's it's such a it's such an honor. It's such a blast because you are so many people. The songs that you're associated with are huge, and I'm going to show this right off the bat. We're talking. This is a, a new album. This is Ron Dante's Funhouse, kind of a riff on. I got my Archie's Funhouse DVD right here. Kind of a riff on the Archie's Funhouse name and theming. You've been doing this for a long time. You started this basically as a teenager, right? Oh yeah, I, I was signed to my first first re, uh, publishing deal, song publishing deal at 17 by a guy named Don Kirshner, who most people know is the, the man who made the monkeys and he had a show called Rock Concert. Time Magazine said he was the man with the golden ear. That's right, I often said, where's the other ear? I often said that to Donnie, but he, he was a great guy. And he signed me as a kid. He said, you, you, you can you write songs and you'll be our demo maker. So I started really young and it was great because it was like going to college. It was like going to musical college. The office was an incredible office. The day I walked into this publishing company, there were these little cubicles all around with pianos in them. And in one cubicle was Carol King and Jerry Goffin. The other cubicle was Neil Sedaka, Howie Greenfield. The other one was Tony Orlando and, and, and a slew of hit songwriters, very young, <clears throat> probably in their young 20s, but they were older to me, all these older guys. But it was, it was a great uh, entrance into the music business. And even before, so, I mean, one of the things that's so cool about this this, is there's commercials here too because you were a jingle man as well i mean tires uh, dentine gum what all what, what are some of your favorite commercials that you uh some of your favorite products well my favorite was uh, coke and Pe pepsi those two were, were great pepsi you've got a lot to live was a multi-million dollar campaign that ran for two or three years and i sang on that i sang for uh I'd like to buy the world a Coke. I'd like to teach the world to sing. I, I was one of my big commercials. No, I, I got around airlines, American Airlines, Pan Am at the time. Uh, I was like a jingle singer. I mean, I was like the guy they would call if they wanted to get a sound like, uh, say, the Beach Boys or, uh, you know, uh, Lou Christie or uh, the Four Seasons. Mm -hmm. They wanted that kind of tenor voice, falsetto, they'd call me. So I, I was always working. You could do the Southern California sound and it sound, I mean, you sound like one of the Wilson brothers when you want to. And then Donovan, you, for the Archies, you kind of adopted sort of a Donovan thing. That's amazing to me. Well, it was just, I had the ear and I was kind of like a chameleon. You know, it's like that. It's like Bruno Mars is like that. I mean, if you listen to him, he could imitate any R&B singer, any pop singer he wants on his records. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was doing. Uh, if you wanted to work in the jingle field, especially, uh, you had to be very uh, adaptable to the sounds. I listened really intensely to uh, the Beach Boys and the California sound. There was a whole different uh, accent involved in those voices instead of the East Coast, which is a, a whole different world of accents. You know? So that's what I did. And it was a lot of fun because it was a challenge every day to who am I going to sound like and how do I develop my own sound? That, that's the important thing too. One of the, speaking of developing your own sound from a very young age, I want to talk a little bit about a band that you were a part of or a group called the detergents that got to tour with the Dick Clark caravan of uh, caravan of stars with the Rolling Stones, right? Yes, we were on the bill. A couple of the dates, one in Philadelphia was with we we were the close. We just went on just before the Stones went on, and it was a great tour. Dick Clark, you know, we did like sixty cities in a summer, mm -hmm. and uh, we were on a bus, and it was it was just great. Uh, I remember the Stones fans had filled one of the huge rooms with cakes and gifts for the Stones. And I remember walking by the room and hearing all this ruckus. And I looked in and the Stones were having a cake fight and throwing cakes all over the place, you know? But they were great to watch live, especially they were just, they just had had satisfaction, which was, had come out and it was a monster hit in the world and especially here. So it was, it was great to tour with those guys. And, you know, I toured with Peter Noon and Herman's Hermits, you know, Freddie and the Dreamers, Little Anthony and the Imperials. Uh, it was a mixed show. It was really cool. Yeah. 
Was it a learning experience in sort of the rock and roll attitude as well? Were you seeing things that may have been new to you? I mean, you were a young guy. I, I imagine that tour might have gotten a little bit crazy. You know, it, it was uh, very conservative. Dick Clark was with us a lot on the bus. Okay. So everybody was kept their, uh, you know, gentlemen, ladies, all the groups. There was no, there was no, uh, nothing I remember that was out of line. Uh, there was no trashing hotel rooms. Uh, this was a very pop, clean tour. And uh, I remember thinking, uh, I'm j I just learned, I learned how to play poker on the, on the bus with the little Anthony and the Imperials would play when we take those long trips at night to the next venue, nobody slept because the bus was going like this and we had sit up seats. We didn't have beds on those things. So mm -hmm. I would play cards with the guys. They taught me how to play poker. Yeah. So you're doing, uh, you're, you're on this tour, you're, you've got this jingle uh, career that is, ba I mean, I've, taken off. You have so many jingles. And then Don Kirshner comes to you about the Archies. Do you remember how, what was your first impression of this offer? I heard about it through a good friend of mine who was playing in the band that was doing the music tracks for the Archies, a guy named Ron Frangipani. Ron Frangipani, famous arranger, close friend who was the best man at my wedding. He called me up. He said, they're doing tracks for this new uh, TV show, Saturday morning cartoon show based on the Archies. And they need a lead singer. Why don't you come over and say hello to Donnie and Kirshner and, and see if you, you know, you, you could become the lead singer. I always knew that this was going to be a hit project. There's no doubt about it. Don Kirshner, the, the man behind all these hits, uh, Jeff Barry was the producer and writer of the, all the songs. And he had written maybe 40 hits in the 60s. He wrote Be My Baby, Da Do Run Run, Hanky Panky, you know his hits, tons with his wife, Ellie Greenwich. So I knew there was a hit team. All I had to do was get up to bat. So it's exactly, I went, I, I talked to both of them in the studio. That day they had me sing Bang Shang Alang, which became our first single. And they said, well, we, you, you'll be the voice. You'll be the lead voice of the group. And that's the way I got involved. But I was really excited about the potential hit uh, quality of this project. I, I knew it had hit written all over. It was just a question of time. Was there any concern or hesitancy about you being the voice on a, basically a weekly cartoon series? Not for me. I, at the time I was singing a lot of jingles. Mm -hmm. I was getting a real career in commercials and uh, I liked it. Uh, it paid well and I didn't have to travel a lot. I could have a home life, get married, do things normally living in New York City. So I, I thought this would be a good uh, stepping stone for future records. I thought you can never put a hit record down, really, you know, unless it's Disco Duck or something, yeah. you know, where, where, where it's a DJ just making fun and having fun. But I thought a, a hit record across the world would be a very big uh, plus in my column as a soloist. So I looked at it as a stepping stone. And it was huge. It was absolutely huge. Could you talk to us a little bit about the success? I had no idea it was going to be as big. I thought it would be big, but I had no idea it would be the number one record of that year or it would sell six million singles. It was a hit in all the countries around the world. They didn't even see the cartoon. They had no idea what the Archies were, except they thought it was a real singing group. And they, uh, they bought the record. They, it, I went to three different cities in uh, like uh, France, Rome, and uh, London on a little tour I did. And I noticed in all the discos, they were playing Sugar Sugar. And people were dancing like crazy to it. They were jumping up and dancing. So I said, this record had a life of its own, this song in particular. So it was a, it was a monstrous hit. I mean, it beat out the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and the Fifth Dimension for record of the year uh, on, on the Billboard and Cashbox charts. Did you ever want to be the, the speaking voice? Was there ever a conversation about you being the speaking voice of Archie during the cartoon? No, it was, it was all the music was done on the East Coast, New York City, all the all the animation voices were done in Los Angeles, and they used traditional voiceover people uh, who mm -hmm. would, you know, who have, will bring, you know, something to the characters. They were actors, you right. know, all the singers are not actors sometimes. Right. So they, they just got actors and they, they put the voices together and it, it was fine. They did all the animation, I think, in the Orient. I don't, I don't think they did animation in Los Angeles. They, they, they put it in you know, Taiwan or in Korea, somewhere on, in the Asian Pacific. They, uh, they did the animation. It was fine, and it, was, it lasts. I, I mean, there are, 
hundreds and hundreds of videos now on YouTube of all the Archie's episodes, all the songs. Uh, Sugar Sugar has been, my particular Sugar Sugar uh, video has been looked at over 300 million times. I mean, it's, it's, it's astounding. I mean, who would have thought when we were doing it, what would happen in the future that you would be interested in talking to me? Right. It's, it's, right. it's, it's, it's a gift because you would, you would bang out multiple tracks in a single day, right? This, they just, they felt, I don't want to say disposable, but they didn't feel like you were, I can't imagine it felt like you were making something for the ages when you were doing it. It, it was, it was a journeyman thing. Everybody was the journeyman musicians, producers, singers, studio singers working with me. The female voice was a girl named Tony Wine. Uh, Miss Tony Wine, who's like a terrific singer songwriter. She did Betty and Veronica's voice. Uh, she ended up writing Groovy Kind of Love <laughs> and Candida. So she was, that we had some great people working on those projects. But we, you know, we thought it was uh, not disposable, but we thought it would have a time limit, maybe two, three years after the series was off, uh, it would fade from people's minds. But uh, with the internet and with the advent of t technology, uh, it will live forever now. Let's take a deviation to the cufflinks because hey, the cufflink there are cufflinks tracks on this this album, but it's it's such a remarkable. Okay, so this is a band that essentially does not exist. There's a story on the back. It might on the, it might be on the back of Tracy about it's like where these guys are from and who they are. They, it doesn't exist. Now there was a touring there was a touring group. Could you tell us a little bit about the cufflinks? Well, the, the trick is I, I I recorded for these producers. Uh, as the detergents, same people, Paul Vance and Lee Pockers. So I kept in touch with them over the years. They called me uh, when they saw the Archie's records were hitting again. They called me. They wanted me to do a demo for one of the songs they had written. So I went in. I listened to uh, Tracy and I said, wow, it's an in interesting, different name. And it's a really good song. I, I remember the music writer, Paul, uh, uh, Lee Pockers, was a very competent keyboardist and melody writer. And he, if you listen to Tracy, there's like three key changes in that song. Nobody picks that up, but it keeps going up, up, up. And uh, it's, it's a little complicated uh, when you play it, but I was very impressed with it. I knew it would have some legs. I, I went in the studio the next day with them and I, I put like 30 voices on of myself. That's the same girl, just two, two pictures of the same girl. But uh, they sa I said to them, I said, listen, I have it. I'm recording as the Archies. If, if this song is a hit, Tracy, I'll do an album for you. I'll sing the whole album. And in a week, I sang the entire album, <laughs> backgrounds, leads. I always wanted that to sound like a, a group like the Association or, or, or the um, Grassroots or even the Turtles. I wanted it to sound like a lot of bop, bop, bahs. Because if you listen to any of those records, there's a lot of ba 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 ba. So I put a lot of ba ba bas in there, and I sang it as best I could. It was a little different voice than the Sugar Sugar voice. You listen to Tracy; that's that's my grown up voice, and Sugar Sugar is my teenage voice. I, I I have different parts of myself that I record with, and um, it was great. Tracy came out, and it was a hit at the same time Sugar Sugar was hit. In fact, uh, Tracy was number nine on one of the charts, and Sugar Sugar was uh, number one. So I wow. had two, two records in the top 10. Let's let's look at, I mean, Barry, a, a long lucrative partnership with Barry Manilow where you're co-producing some of the biggest records of the 1970s into, into in, you know, and beyond. I, I say Copacabana at the beginning of this, at the beginning of this interview. I mean, what a huge song that was. You're Mandy. I mean, these are giant songs. You go from one giant, one giant career to another giant career. I was just the kind of guy I would say yes to projects. I didn't like stick with one thing. I, I, I wouldn't mind if something seemed a little, okay, you're doing teenage music with the Archies, but you're gonna do grown up music with Barry Mandel. I wasn't scared of that. I, I was a musician, I played guitar. I, I knew, I knew the, the genre. And uh, when I met Mandel, uh, we were doing a commercial together. And so he had written it, arranged it, and we ended up singing it together. And I said, well, he's a very talented guy. And he said to me, I would like to record as a solo artist. So I said, fine, let me hear some of your songs. So next day he played me a song, Could It Be Magic? And I said, wow. He said, this was done earlier by Tony Orlando producing it as an up-tempo record as a ghost group called Featherbed. He said, but I'd like to do it real. I said, yes, you must do it real. We must do it the way you wrote the song as a ballad and build it, build it. And that's the way our relationship started as co-producers. And it went on for like nine years. 
It was, it was an unbelievable run. We had 18 singles in the top 10 over a six, seven year period. It was unbelievable. Uh, what a talent he is. He's still selling out in Vegas. He's doing great. But because you had such opportunity to keep things varied, did you ever want feel a need to distance yourself from the Archie's music, from the bubblegum, you know, I don't know if that's a derogatory term, but I mean, did you ever, did it ever feel like an albatross or sort of a, you know, like I, I'm doing this now. I'm very proud of the Archie's music. It's going to last a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, they, when, they, when they say bubblegum, I'm very proud of bubblegum because we weren't making albums for the guests, for the, for the you know, the, the, the rock and rollers, the heavy duty rock and rollers. We we're making for preteens, nine mm -hmm. to 13. And, and, and that, that the, the adults loved it, but that's who we were making it for. And I was proud of it. We hit it right on the head. So it, it didn't hobble me in any way in my career. Uh, it was just another thing people would talk about, you know, e even people like Kiss love the Archies, you know, or even the Rolling Stones. They, 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 some of their favorite music is an Archie song. So you never can tell what's going to go. I'm never be ashamed of something that's been so successful. So I, I embrace it. That's great to hear. A hit's a hit no matter what genre it is. And it's um, been recorded by like dozens of people. Wilson Pickett had a version of it that went top 10. Tina Turner did it. Uh, all kinds of artists recorded the song and were fairly successful. So let's bring us up to now. You, you have this new CD, but you're also gearing up for another tour. You're going out with the, the Happy Together Tour. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the Happy Together Tour has been going for like 10, 11 years. And about four years ago, I joined it as their opening act, as the Archies. So I get out there and I, we, we toured like 50, 60 cities and I got to see all these fans live and in, in these big venues. And the following year, they called me up, the, the tour managers called me up and they said, listen, would you like to become the lead singer of the Turtles on the next tour? I said, before they finished that statement, I said, yes. I said, great. I love their hits. They've got five or six monster hits, including I went from the opening act to the closing act. It was, it was like in one year. So it was, it was another great, great occurrence. And I did that for two years. Last year was canceled. So, but we were supposed to tour another 50, 60 cities. This year, we've got an abridged uh, tour all through August. We'll do about 25, 30 dates. Next year is, looks like it's going to be sold out again. So I get to do the Turtles hits. And then in the middle of the act, I do a few of my, I do uh, Sugar Sugar and Tracy. And so, I, and people say, oh, he also did that. So it's, it's, a, it's a great moment in the tour. And the, the other acts on the tour are wonderful. I mean, we have the association, we have Gary Puckett and the Union Gap. We have the Cow Sills, one of my favorite groups, singing groups ever. It's, it's, a, it's, it's just great to be on the tour again with these, oh, the, the Classics Four and the Vogues were also on the tour. So when, when you're on stage and you're singing these songs out to the audience, who is looking back at you? What faces do you see? Ages and, and uh, you know, uh, ethnicities. Is it everybody? It's everybody. We get everybody. We get a, a big cross section of America when we play. Uh, of course, the people who grew up to the music are there. You know, they're over 50, over 60. And they come out in droves because they're healthy. They're ready to spend their money and go see their favorite acts, but they bring their sons and daughters. So I see a lot of the younger faces in the audience and even grandchildren come because of the, you know, so these hits are very, most of them are really clean cut, you know, joy to the world and happy together, you know, mm -hmm. so, and sugar, sugar, of course. So uh, we, I see a lot of smiling faces out there and a good cross section of America comes out and boy, they're going to come out big time now because they've been pent up for a year and a half they can't wait to go because there's nothing like you know it there's nothing like experiencing live music and also our band recreates the tracks that will go along with these hits we don't try to do different versions we do the record hit same same tempo uh, same arrangement and same keys so you know some artists when they get older they lower the key yeah. <laughs> they were tenors when they were young but now they're baritones or basses so uh, it, it, it's a wonderful night in the theater. You know, it's a two, hour, two and a half hours of pure joy. Would you tell people a little bit about this CD? It's a double disc set and I love it. Tell people what, what it is. Well, the Funhouse, I wanted to put together a nice double CD that had many of my groups. 
the, the Spider-Man group, the Cufflinks, uh, even a, an Asian American group from a cartoon show I did called The Amazing Chan and the Chan Clan, which was the first Asian American cartoon show featuring the legendary character Charlie Chan and his family. So I put that on there, two cuts. I put some of my commercials maybe four or five of my, my cool commercials that I wanted people to hear. I did a couple of duets on there. I have guest artist Bruce Johnston from the Beach Boys is singing with me on All Summer Long. Uh, Andy Kim, uh, the great uh, singer songwriter who wrote, co-wrote Sugar Sugar. He's on there with Rock Me Gently. So uh, I have some good things. Tony Wine, the girl voice of the Archies. She's on there singing Summer in the City with me. So I tried to put a few of my friends on there and, uh, and just it was it was a joy to put this package together because I had the guy who does the cartoons the covers for the Archie's comics did the cover mm -hmm. as a favor to me, Dan Parent. And uh, it, it was just great. It's just great to have him do it. But I'm gonna put a link in the description of this video where people can go purchase this. It supports you and a dollar for each unit sold goes to the Shriners Hospital for Children, which is a very worthy cause. I'm a big fan of that and St. Jude's. They also can get an autographed copy of it on uh, Chuck Negron's uh, wife is a, uh, has a site called Amy's Pop and Rock Shop on Facebook. Amy's Pop and Rock Shop on Facebook. And on there, she has some of my memorabilia that people might want to be interested in from mugs to pictures to this autographed CD. So uh, they might want to check that out, your friends and fans. So aside from picking up the CD, checking out that site uh, and picking up a ticket to see you on tour, where can people keep up with what's going on right now with you? Uh, go to rondante.com. You can find me there and it's, it, it has a link to Facebook uh, and you, and you go and on my Facebook page, I read everything on Facebook. I try to keep up with it as much as possible. Uh, so Facebook's the best place. Look for me in a red jacket. That's, that's, that's one of the official sites and another in a, a day glow shirt. I have two sites. Well, sir, this has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time, for sharing these uh, wonderful experiences behind the songs that we love. Uh, I really appreciate this. Thank you. I, I love I love talking about it. It's so much fun. You had all the right questions, Heath. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you guys for watching this. Make your uh, Join in the comments below. We'll continue to celebrate this music and the legacy. And uh, it's still alive. It's on tour right now. So uh, let's, let's keep it. Let's keep that energy going in the comments. Guys, thank you so much, Mr. Dante. Thank you. Until next time, we will catch you later.